I want to welcome everybody to the main meeting of the uh, SBELC, that's the Silicon Valley Engineering Leadership Community. And we place the emphasis on community. That's why it's so wonderful to see so many great faces out here this evening. Uh, looking at, uh, to look at our main topic, I was really intrigued when I first uh, saw this, uh, this presentation proposal uh, from Bell, uh, Manage Like an Engineer. And then I, I thought it was great that she had to put the in brackets the seriously there. Now, Bell's background, she can actually speak to this stuff because she comes up through that, that engineering background and has been in uh, engineering leadership roles like a, a lot of us. But she's moved on to a more consulting environment, deals with startups and, and things like that. And uh, she's going to enlighten us on this, on this notion of not losing that engineering thinking uh, of so often there's this chasm between the, the, the manager and the engineer, and she's going to help us smooth that over and make, see it a, a bit more as a continuous thing. And so uh, with no further uh, embellishment from me, I'm going to turn it over to Belle Walker. Awesome. Thank you so much. That was a fabulous introduction. Let me get my screen shared here. All right. So plan for this evening. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit, ask some questions as we're going through, and then towards the end we're going to do some breakout rooms because I would say rather than enlightening, my goal is to get some wheels turning, uh, spark some ideas and get everyone thinking over the course of the next uh, hour, however long we have. Um, so uh, following up on the introductions, before I tell you about me, I'd like to ask a question about you. So if we could use the raise hands function in the participants pane, I am curious how many people on this call uh, have a team that reports to them right now, has had one in the past or hopes to have one in the future. Perfect, so uh, the, the quick answer um, is that it is well over half. And this is a question I thought was important to ask because I believe everyone in this community is very well aware being a leader does not necessarily mean that you have a team reporting to you or direct reports. However, uh, this talk is really geared towards that subset of leaders. Um, so uh, good to know we've got quite a few of you in the room and the rest of you, I'm pretty sure you have reported to other people. And so maybe these are some, th some things to bear in mind and you can uh, help the people that you report to think about them as well. So a little bit about me. Um, I come from a long family of engineers. Uh, my great grandfather, great uncle, grandfather, aunt, uncle, father, mother, uh, siblings, the piles of engineers all kicking around. Um, and so I really grew up talking about Java race conditions as Christmas dinner table conversation. Um, it's part of my blood and it's something I continued on into my education. Uh, so I got my undergraduate degree in mechanical engineering and eventually went back for a systems engineering degree, which I finished uh, my master's this, a couple weeks before my brother finished his undergraduate engineering degree. Um, he was at Harvey Mudd, so general engineering. I have continued this engineering theme into my personal life. I chose to marry an engineer. We've got two cats, and I can only assume that the cats would also be engineers if they had been lucky enough to have opposable thumbs. <laughs> when I am not <laughs> studying or working, I like to fly. Um, I've had my pilot's license since I was in high school. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'm an aviation um, major. I'm very proud of that. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Um, and so I, I wanted to study uh, aerospace engineering, but we didn't have it as an option. So I did mechanical uh, and cross registered for some aerospace class. Uh, and the flying actually helped get me my very first job. This last panel represents my career. Uh, my first job out of school was to build a aerial photography operation uh, for Google. Um, and so I have actually been building organizations rather than mechanical structures for pretty much my entire career. Uh, my most recent engineering management role was a director of engineering for a company called Here Technologies, which creates digital maps. And I was working in the division that made maps for highly uh, autonomous driving. Uh, what you can see here is a representation of what those maps look like and this big old number is something called the quality index, which I developed to help the 
automated driving vehicles uh, use the map as one sensor in their suite and figure out how to weigh it against uh, the LIDAR and the cameras and all of that other input. Um, so I really enjoyed uh, the technical aspects of my work, but perhaps my favorite part of that role was the uh, very complex uh, composition of my team. So I had software engineers, process engineers, um, I had project managers, um, all, all sorts of different people. And it was uh, an ongoing and really fun challenge to keep everyone working smoothly together. Uh, since I left here, I have gone all fancy and decided to become a consultant, uh, working with companies to look at their ways of working and their organization operational structures, but with that engineering mindset uh, so that they can reduce the, the friction in their day-to-day -day operations, which gains them efficiency, but also a lot of engagement. Uh, it's a win-win kind of no matter how you cut it. You look remarkably like a pilot in that photo. I do, thank you. <laughs> Funny how that works. So, uh, speaking of being intrigued, I, I want to take a moment to be a little more specific about why I'm talking about managing in a leadership forum. So I've got this spoiler alert already out on the slide. Our modern companies ask a lot from team leaders, uh, which is the term I'm going to use for the moment for, for managers. Um, so obviously, they need to lead. They need to inspire. They need to motivate. They need to be uh, demonstrate humility, encourage their teams, think about strategy, have that vision, have that passion. But there's a subset that we also expect from the people who have a team reporting to them. You can either think of this as a completely embedded Venn diagram or as a wedding cake top down view, because the point is leadership is fundamental and necessary. But you also need to enable your team when they report directly to you. That's a responsibility that is not always associated with pure leadership, but when they, those people depend on you, it is your job to enable them. So training uh, these days is, has come a very long way, I think from uh, a couple decades ago, and it focuses very heavily on leadership. Absolutely crucial, um, but it's also sometimes insufficient. So I see a lot of new managers go through leadership training. They uh, take in the need to inspire their teams, motivate them, and they often uh, realize that micromanagement is a terrible idea, but they are so terrified of micromanagement that they end up treating their teams completely hands off. They get them very excited and then say, go, go figure it out. Um, or they don't really think about the micromanagement and that's all they've known and they end up down in the weeds controlling everything that their team does. In both cases, it's not really the manager who's going to feel the pain, it's the team. The good news is there's a better way. Uh, and the extra good news is that anyone who comes from a technical or engineering background has a leg up because what I'm going to walk through now is how you can take some basic engineering principles and use them in that team leadership role to better enable the folks who report to you. So we're going to start with a nice simple concept, limiting factors, and the concept of critical path. The idea of a critical path is um, all of the things that have to happen to get from where you start to your end goal, uh, and the idea is the limiting factors are what determine the, how short that time can be. I'm using time, this principle works in all different places. We'll go with time for now. Since this is Silicon Valley, I figured the best context to talk about limiting factors in would be uh, something from software engineering. So I picked Fl Flynn's taxonomy. So this is a really old paper uh, from the 1960s in the early days of computing. Um, and Flynn basically proposed that you could determine how quickly a program would execute based on two parameters. Is the data accessible uh, in parallel? And can the instructions be executed in parallel? Going to illustrate this with a nice, simple uh, program that has one data source and performs two operations. In the ideal scenario, with our shortest critical path and no limiting factors, 
On the first count, our data goes directly to our instructions. On the second count, our operations execute, and we get to the result. Yay! But what happens when you can only uh, execute one instruction at a time? Your first count still gets you your data to your operations, but now you have to go through two counts before you get to your result. Similarly, if you can only uh, access your data from one place at a time, you have to go through one count to get to your first operation, a second count to get to your second operation, that third count before you can get to your result. It didn't matter that the first operation was able to execute on the second count. What mattered was that we didn't get to our result until the third. So what on earth does this have to do with Teams? Well, I would propose that one way you can look at how quickly your team can achieve their goals is dependent on can they do their work in parallel and is the team leader uh, a part of that critical path. So I'm going to use another example and this is uh, a, an equally simple system, but it is a real example from a team who reported into me. This was a software engineering team that uh, was responsible for creating tooling um, and implementing that quality index I talked about earlier. The manager um, felt that his employees deserved the benefit of his much uh, broader technical experience. Um, and while that is a fabulous intention, he implemented it by requiring that all code reviews go through him. So the first count, the, yeah, I see a thumbs down. That's exactly right. So on the first count, uh, the employees would uh, develop their code. They would put together whatever they wanted to submit. It would go to the manager. And it turns out that he also had other responsibilities. And so that second count could be quite a while. And then eventually they were able to actually deliver what, what they needed to deliver. Yeah, so how do we fix this? Well, not too complicated. We moved the manager out of the critical path. We made it one step. The team does their work, and then we have the result. So what does the manager do? Well, Ron's written an entire book about it, and you should go read that and watch his videos, but I'm going to dramatically oversimplify for this particular case and just say that sometimes roadblocks popped up. And a great example of a roadblock would be that the team, who, who were two fairly junior engineers, sometimes they didn't have the technical expertise to get all the way to the result. Sometimes it was bureaucratic, whatever. When there were roadblocks, the manager, his job was to remove them. So very, fairly simple concept. So I, I, want, I want to chime in. You're, you're actually describing my life right now, which is how faith in your team and people, especially even, even the new ones that have them execute, let the problem is, and you step in the way, and when you say, okay, you have a problem, you need like an, an upgrade to Oracle. Okay, I will take care of that. You let them go about the day-to-day -day digging in, trust that. You just remove the roadblocks. You're just describing my life. Oh my God, sorry. No, no, that's great. It, it is fabulous to hear example of people who are already. Yeah, no, this is my life. In this way, awesome. Uh, all right, so that was, that was principle one. Now we're going to go on to principle number two. Uh, I'm going to call basic structures, and this is going to go back to my education in mechanical engineering. Um, so very high level summary, when mechanical structural engineers are designing structures, they usually try to figure out what the expected loads are and design to optimize for that load. It's a whole bunch of jargon. Um, so we're going to use there's, this is all examples. You'll, you'll pick up on that. Uh, we're going to use this time the example of a contest from my very first formal engineering class in college. At the end of the class, we had a contest where we were told there were going to be two supports uh, and one force directly between them. And our job was to build the best structure. Uh, best was a function of supporting the most force and a little bit of weighting towards a cost function for the materials that we used. So uh, during the class, we had been studying truss structures. So my team of three designed a truss structure and we were getting ready to call it a day. We've got some triangles on a whiteboard, but I was a freshman and I was super excited to be doing my first project. And I was not going to settle for just any truss structure with just any number of triangles. We were going to have the exact right number of triangles in our truss. 
So we started doing a force analysis. And the first thing we figured out was that that particular piece of the structure was not actually doing anything. And either was that one or that one or, oh crap, pretty much all of them, pardon my language, were doing nothing. The only elements of this structure that were carrying any force were this one triangle in the middle. And there were three of us working on this and we all thought that was crazy. Why would we be studying trusses if this was the answer? So we did it again. And three hours later with three people, we had designed a triangle. And I was so struck by the notion that it took us nine person hours to design a triangle that I took a picture of the homework that we turned in showing the triangle. I uh, remember the part where I said eager freshman, not joking about that. Um, I will draw particular attention to the note that I am not good at drawing. But so back to the, the question we asked ourselves, why were we studying trust structures if the answer to the con contest was a triangle? Well, the trick is that the way the contest was set up was for one force. If there had been multiple forces, we would have uh, likely needed that trust structure. And depending on how the forces were distributed and what their various uh, magnitudes were, we might have even needed different materials at different places in that trust structure. So what does that have to do with teams? Well, let's talk about another team that reported to me while I was working at HERE. And this team evolved from a single repetitive task that they did uh, to complex project management work. So specifically here, I mentioned is a digital mapping company um, and they send out vehicles like this. Um, so does Google, Microsoft, pretty much anyone who makes digital maps. Um, and these vehicles collect raw data that gets trans, uh, translated into the map product. There's a whole bunch of sensors on the vehicle. There's a GPS, antenna, there's an IMU, there are cameras, there's LIDAR, and all of that data gets collected and written to hard drives in separate data streams. And so after the vehicle's done driving around, they ship the hard drive off, and those data streams have to be post-processed, um, partly to improve them and partly to merge them all together. There's quite a few cars driving around, uh, quite a lot of data, and most of it processes very smoothly. But some of it has issues. And so this team's responsibility was to take the drives that were having trouble processing, debug them, uh, get them working, or declare them failures, and uh, send the vehicle back out to capture it again. So the way this team worked was the manager uh, took the responsibility for taking in all of these requests, all of these drives, and distributing the work across the team members. So you could basically think of it as a table with a whole bunch of legs. And while this was what they were doing, it, it worked pretty well. But then the world changed. Uh, over time, these drives and this debugging work was moved on to another team. And the team that I'm talking about uh, became responsible for the training data that was used in the machine learning algorithms. Now, I don't know how many of you are machine learning researchers, but it is uh, not a super typical configuration to have a separate team that is dealing with the training data, um, but it worked really well. Um, so what this team did was they took requests from the researchers. Uh, so for example, on, on this side, this is a, obviously a screenshot that I pulled from the internet, not from my time at the company. Um, each of these uh, little rows here represents a feature that a machine learning researcher had asked for. Uh, the same team designed the tools like this one, although this is one of many. They worked with the operations teams who actually created these labels, um, and they were a feedback mechanism across all of these different pieces, um, and the software engineering teams that, that built the tools. So that ended up turning these very predictable, straightforward, repetitive tasks into all sorts of different tasks and requests that came in from all different directions from all these different stakeholders they now had. The structure did not hold up very well under all these new forces. It was pretty unstable. So what I'm gonna do now is summarize several months of experimentation and iteration. During that time, we worked, the team manager and I worked with each of the different team members. We 
tried to figure out what they liked most about what they were doing, where they really excelled at the work that the team was responsible for. And through that process, we realized that there were two more senior team members who were both pretty good at taking in uh, these requests and finding out which team members could take them on and also providing technical depth across all the different things because of their experience. With their support, the less senior team members were actually able to take on more work uh, and they were able to execute much more effectively. When we then put this structure into place, oh, there's no wobble animation because it worked really well. Um, and so by rethinking how the team was configured, they were able to stand up to uh, this new and much more intense set of challenges. Now you may be thinking, why, where did the aqua bar go? Why didn't that come over to the other side? Well, there's two things. One, the main activity that the manager was doing was no longer filtering requests. It was helping his team figure out how they could best work together and how they could be structured. He also became another fist of justice to help remove the roadblocks for the team. So this is the end of the story, right? We had a team, they went through an evolution, they had a new structure, great. No, 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 that's not how the world works. Um, there were more features that needed doing and more complications with every request. And over time, the structure ended up being not quite strong enough again. So the first thing we tried was to just reinforce it. Let's add some new team members. It helped, it was a little more resilient but not quite where we wanted it to be. So we had to step back. Uh, adding the team members was the easy version. We had to go back to that experimentation and iteration. And this time we found out that some of the team members who had not been very senior at the first iteration had learned a lot and they were now able to also work more horizontally within the team, support the new team members and each other, and they were able to cross brace. Again, no, uh, no wobble animation. They had found something that was gonna work for them. Now, similarly with uh, engineering and um, structural engineering, if you had tried to create this very robust cross-braced structure for just those initial repetitive tasks, it would have been pretty intensely over-engineered. There's a lot of touch points, there's a lot of coordination and collaboration that needs to happen, and it's not necessarily a problem, but it can introduce more challenges and complications. So it's worth taking a moment to see if it's worthwhile. But does that mean that all of the teams dealing with these repetitive tasks should have been structured like the first one? Well, of course not. A trust type approach might have been equally effective. If you were able to think of your team members as triangles who have similar properties and are able to fit in together, they could just as easily have dealt with those initial requests. The key that I'm trying to communicate here is not that there is a mechanical structure that is correct for team organization. The point is that thinking about mechanical structures and strengths is a way that you can visualize the way your team works together to make sure that they are prepared and enabled to tackle the challenges that come at them. So uh, I'm gonna take a moment in, in closing to, to hearken back to the days of scientific management. Um, scientific management is basically the notion that all people are cogs and interchangeable cogs in a machine. And I found this image uh, a couple weeks ago and I was so excited by it because it is so ridiculous on so many levels. One, obviously people do not work this way. But two, machines don't work this way either. No one would build this. It makes no sense. Actual cogs have different strengths, different materials, different gearing mechanisms, the whole point of putting gears and cogs together is to use those differences to achieve an end goal. And so my theory is that scientific management was so bonkers because it was not developed by real engineers in the first place. 
So let's go through some key takeaways before we jump into breakout rooms and talk about some of these ideas a little more. So let's remind high level, leading, motivating, inspiring, and I'm proposing that when you've got a team reporting to you, you also need to be able to enable them. Good news for those of you with technical backgrounds, engineering backgrounds, engineering principles can be used to enable rather than micromanage teams. Experimenting and iterating is just as much a part of management as engineering. Um, and this is something I, I'm saying with my words, not with my pictures. And so I'm just gonna say it three more times to hopefully make sure everyone hears it. It's very, I have not yet found a great way to represent the, the trials and the iterations that we went through to help make sure that each team member ended up in a place that was a good match for them and used their strengths. But if we go, well, actually maybe now I do have an idea. If we went back to that picture of the teams and you tried to take some of those cross bracing and put them straight up, they wouldn't fit in the structure anymore. So you really do have to think about how the individuals you have will work best together. And that is going to take some experiment and some iteration. Can I just expand a little bit? Because I actually made me think about my team. They're all, they're all kind of supportive, but the same there's different sizes, I guess you say. They're good at this or they're different shapes. I don't know how to put it. Some people are good at this, some people are good at that. And some are bigger, bigger team leaders, some are smaller. It's really kind of hard to describe with this. I mean, nothing's wrong with the trust. I like your trust idea. But the trust is almost too simplistic because it makes, it makes each part look equal. Yeah. yeah, and and the trust, my guess is that that is a very rare actual configuration um, yeah. because you are very rarely going to have uh, people who are all equal. What, what I found is helpful is in a situation like yours to try and pick something, whether it's triangles or beams or whatever, and think about, you know, what makes each of my people different, right? Are some of them... Right able to do broader work. Some of them have more vertical depth. Some of them have um, more uh, esoteric expertise. Um, some of them are really good coordinators. Um, yeah. And if I can find a way to sort of represent that, even just if I've got all the pieces kind of laid out on one paper or whiteboard or whatever, then I can start moving them around. And it's, again, an iterative process. I start moving things yeah. around and they go, well, that structurally doesn't work, but well, let's see, maybe if I change this structure, oh, I can see how that actually reflects this person. Or it tells me, no, no, it doesn't work because that's not how those two people or how this team would work together. Yeah, I mean, I, I see people who can grow into roles because I have someone who's fairly junior who's actually being a pretty good lead. And, and but at the same time, I, I, oh, I'm sorry, I completely lost my thought for some reason. It just... It's just very funny how you have to kind of juggle these people and get them, to, and get them put together. And there's people who I thought who actually could do my job, I realized they can't even do my job because they, you need even a broader, you get up there, it's the broaderness of things get bigger. Yeah, uh, the, the, the advanced class in this yeah. would be to then go back to some of those structures and say, well, one, how do you uh, modify them to allow for growth and to encourage growth, right? And that's a slightly different modality where uh, instead of trying to make a wobbly structure robust, you ask, yeah. where am I willing to accept some wobble now yeah. because right. of the long-term benefit? I, I guess the way the way I look at it is I, I feel like sometimes I'm analyzing the whole load on the bridge. And mm -hmm. I know and people who are doing it, they want to be the trust. They want to be the trust. That's what they want. This is where I have to be. I have to be doing this. It's like, no, no, you need to look at this. They're like, no, no, I need to concentrate on this. I guess yeah, that's and, the analysis. Part of what I like about this is then, if, especially if they have that technical background, you can use a metaphor like this yeah, or yeah. something that's, that's within their expertise to say, look, I know you're very focused on this piece, but what if this was an engineering challenge? Yeah. Would you really just solve that, that one piece of it or would you think about the, the bigger picture? Yeah. Um, um, if I may jump in briefly yeah. on this too. Yeah. <laughs> Even if you did have engineers that were all the, all the same cog size, if you will. So they all were at the same skill level, they all uh, had the same skill level and the same development language, working with the same APIs, working with the same whatever. They would still, it is inherent in the beast that is people. They would have different interaction styles or other things like that. And, and part of the reason that I know that is, you know, having been someone that, you know, actually speaks on the topic of building teams yeah. in, or hiring teams, not tasks, is, is that when you hire teams that look exactly alike, they, they inevitably explode. 
you know, it, it's, you know, the, it's the opposites attract, uh, you know, the sa same poles generally repel each other and they wind up uh, stepping on, on each other when that happens. So, you know, I, I would draw back to your <clears throat> trust example and you talking about different forces. And so that one force might be specific sets of skills, but another force might be the interactions required between yeah. personality types, whether, you know, hearkening back to the earlier session that we had in, as part of the uh, academy, uh, where uh, for those that wasn't, weren't there, it was talking about that, that cross silo communication. If you're working with somebody that is not the same, you might choose a, exactly the same skill set, but a different personality type. So there's, there's just so many mix and matches. Yeah, no, I, I agree. Um, um, and I saw Susan raised her hand. I don't know, Susan, if you wanted to, to jump in uh, in response to what Rob said or. You're on mute, Susan. I think John is also looking to, uh, John Smithers is also looking to weigh in, but uh, come off mute, mute Susan. Uh, I could jump in quickly. So maybe um, consideration whether you should find like the right place for it, like uh, trust, but um, from developing those you know, people for different roles. It's a bit of risky if there's one person supporting a lot of things and trying to find for them, uh, you know, the perfect place to support instead of, uh, you know, spreading the load. So maybe they can't work at full efficiency, but it might be best if uh, the other people can learn from that guy. I, I think that is, yeah, that is touching on a principle I would summarize as single point of failure, which is something that pretty much no engineer I know uh, accepts without comment in their technical work. And yet I know dozens of managers who have gone into the break room or the water cooler and said, oh, if this one person leaves, I'm doomed. And then they go back to their desk and do nothing about it. Right. And I'm, it's just sort of pulling things together. It's a matter of balance. So if we go on Tom's you know, metaphor that people are different sizes and different shapes and the trust being, you know, very equal may not be that good metaphor, but if you think about a weight and a balance, you might have different pieces of different sizes, but when you put them on each side, you level out that seesaw. Yeah, yeah. So that's I like to think of balance. You guys are... Um. I, the problem, one of the problems I have with the analogy is that you know is none of those mem none of those pieces of the trust those indivi are, are individual uh, solid pieces because there's going to be hope there's going to be holes in people's knowledge so an individual's trust would even even a uh, member of that trust would actually be multiple members bolted together I mean. <laughs> And then maybe that's a good way for to think about the, the teams and the skill sets on your end, right? They, like I said, I'm, oh, wait, aha. <laughs> this presentation is definitely not intended to send you all home and say, my team is triangles. How am I going to work with that? Or, you know, how do I make them into beams, right? That is, that is not what I'm going for here. What I'm trying to do is, is get a conversation going where you say, is there something that I have spent my career ex you know, developing my skill with in this technical forum that I can bring into my new role to better support the people who depend on me? Um, and with that in mind, uh, I wanted to do a couple of breakout rooms um, to ask two questions. So the first one is uh, to ask which situations in your experience have benefited or would have benefited from the use of these principles by a team leader manager. And so this can be something that you experienced yourself and looking back in retrospect, say, oh, you know, if I had just seen it this way or something that you were a part of. Um, and just a sneak preview so that you're ready for the second one. Uh, and we touched on this a little bit, single point of failure, et cetera. What are some other engineering principles that leaders can leverage to enable the teams that they lead? Um, and I'm going to stop sharing my screen for a moment and see what we can do in terms of breakout rooms. Avoid that. So uh, I'm curious you know, if anyone wants to share their, their favorite thing they thought of or heard in their breakout session, I would love to hear it. Don't be engineers. 
Well, um, I was with uh, I was with uh, several, and one of the things which came out, um, I, I th th this is well, it's sort of a general uh, engineering principle: try to treat the underlying cause, not the symptoms. And mm -hmm. this applies to engineering and it applies to management. And uh, the management example would be, let's say you have a team where members are squabbling. You could yell at them, shut up, stop your squabbling. That's treating the symptom. But what you really want to do is find out why are they squabbling. And you, so you, you want to treat the underlying cause. And, and that's the same rule applies to engineering. That's right. That's an awesome point. I like that, John. Can I build on that point? Is that all right? Please do. Right, so th that is, in terms of uh, team alignment and engagement and friction across silos and finger pointing, that's often because people don't have shared goals. They don't have a shared understanding of what everybody's responsible for. They don't know how to step back right and root cause might be you and i have a different understanding of who the customer is and thus we have different goals and thus we're in conflict <laughs> yeah ellen grace when i talk about what i do for consulting i often wave my hands around like this and talk about how if if where you're trying to go is over here but you've got a bunch of structures like your incentive structure your governance model pointed over here these yes. are diverging but you're, you're all up like you're going to get somewhere vaguely the right direction, but you're wasting so much energy to those. That's that right. Gap, right. That's, it's, it's the that's same right. thing. That's right. And that's the other point. What happens oftentimes on teams, whether it's engineering or otherwise, is the incentives aren't in alignment with the goals. Susan raised that earlier. It's like if you're in set, like on the customer support team, if you're incenting people based on how short their calls are <laughs> with customers, they're going to do what they can to get the customer off the phone and not worry about whether or not the customer is satisfied and the problem was solved. And so uh, to in, in closing, because I think we're running out of time, I want okay, we, got, we got about 10 minutes or so. We're okay. Oh, 10 minutes. Oh, good. Let me know. It's quarter, it's quarter, it's quarter after eight. I've got one, one last bit to share with you. So good. All right. Never mind. Now let me shut the conversation down. Someone else come back in. Next. Anyone? Oh. Oh, yeah. Well, um, we rambled a little bit and then Kong Ying brought us back together. And a lot of what we were chatting about was about magnets and how opposites attract. And then Casper brought up, you know, how when metal rubs against each other, that it gets the magnetic property. So that's when you're working together closely, you build those relationships and those bonds where you you know you may not known each other you might have even hated each other but when you're forced to work together eventually you know good things happen so it was really interesting to start talking about magnets and how it all related but doesn't that depend on a certain mental mental flexibility on the people because like it was mentioned i think you mentioned it now that basically some managers step in, they say, it's my way or the highway. So you really need a, you need a basically a flexible, somebody has a flexible brain or flexible to understand that maybe, I mean, I always say, I don't know everything. Tell me, that's why people are close to the product. Tell me why this is a problem. And then we can have a conversation based on that. Well, and some materials will magnetize, some materials won't, yeah. right? So one question- Some will catch fire. Yeah, right, yes. exactly. Yes. Right, again, right. remembering that each person is an individual. Is this an individual who, when they are in close contact with the team, will explode into flames, will magnetize for stronger affinity, right? It, it's, the, these, it's a combination of the principles and understanding the people you're actually dealing with. And the build, the, the build on something that Susan, sorry, that Susan just said, she says, the strongest leaders listen and learn. It's like basically, understand you are not that you know you need these people to work together give them the chance to uh i should do it like this there you go you need to listen to your team i'm using my <laughs> ipad for facial lighting <laughs> That's great. plus are you are you in an environment where you can you can admit where you need help where you have a hole in your knowledge right or are you in an environment where you become defensive and becoming defensive oh. 
Just and, and and John raised a big thing, which is like, as I overlook, I can't tell you how many things I look at this messaging group. I admit, Tom, I don't know everything. I will forget. You, and basically, and I admit that there's no such thing as a stupid question. I, I will have a day when I'm just off. And so please help me with this. When you have your off day, you know, I'll help you out. You know, and everything. I encourage people to write things down, take notes, do all these things that will scare other people. So. And and one thing I've I've seen cons a lot, which is you, know, you get a group of people together to to uh, brainstorm about something, and somebody suggests something, and I don't know why, but everybody seems to think it's their job to shoot it down instead of figuring out how to make it ha work. So maybe try to support each other and figure out how to make things work instead of right. tearing it down. Right. And I always, I always challenge, sorry, I always challenge new team members. You, you, you've never seen what we're doing before. Come and show us. What do you know? What, you know, show us something, show me something we don't know. Right. Come back to Ellen Grace's you Tinker Toys, right? right. If, if someone has an idea, if you can add more pieces to it, you're going to get to the structure you're trying to get to much faster than if you tear apart whatever the last person just put together. Well, it, the, the culture, the engineering culture and other cultures are so competitive and there's so much there's so much um in that culture sometimes where it's one-upmanship right yeah and the other thing is people don't understand the nature of brainstorming somebody hasn't set the right parameters because in brainstorming it's not the point to evaluate ideas it's the point the point is to generate ideas and evaluate them later well and but you know human well, brains are are um Human brains are conditioned to be favoring negative. And oh, by the way, negative people seem smarter. So there's a payoff for criticizing, condemning, and complaining and being like the BMWs of the team, bitching, moaning, and whining. And that's part of why I like the critical I path, love that. especially for, uh, for team leaders, is to remind them that if they insist on sticking themselves, you know, if they're going to be a wall, if, if for anyone, right? If you're going to be a wall that none of the ideas can get through, well, then you're not going to ever get to where you need to go, right? It's Well, your team is limited by your own participation then. That's right. right. Yeah, that's a nice way to state it also, Skip. Nice. Don't be the limiting factor, right, Bell? You don't want to be the limiting yeah, factor. Yeah, the law of, law of yeah, constraints, it, and you just became the constraint. And it's funny you would say that, because I've actually I said, that's the one thing they don't teach at Harvard Business School. I, 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 I'd laugh over that, because I've seen in you know places where they're like, The only thing? Yeah, no, no, they, they just they just don't know when do you, when do you become the problem? When are you the problem? Well, and the complement to that is is leverage. For example, I'll pick on, on Kimberly over here because she's influenced so many people. Is if I'm in a, in a in a team or something and I say, well, what would Kimberly do there? And I anticipate and do what she would have, have coached in. All of a sudden, her leverage is extended through entirely my team, my connections, and whatnot. So there's a there's a big multiplier in there. That's what manager leverage is about. Yeah. I gotta say though, if everyone around you is an asshole, chances are you're the asshole. <laughs> or or, or the victim. Truth. There is or lots the of victim. Yeah. 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 All right. Do I have another analogy to run? Oh. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we're doing good. Go ahead. Yep. All right. uh, uh, this, I come out of an AI background. We did uh, artificial intelligence expert systems years and years ago. And uh, one of the problem solving methods is hill climbing, you know, where from where you are, you make a move that takes you uphill, uh, where uphill means closer to the goal. Uh, but the problems with, the, with hill climbing as an algorithm is local maximum. Mm. Uh, so you get to a local max, and now every move you make from that spot is, is a negative. So everyone you're communicating with about why we have to make this move has their own reason why that's a bad move. And all of them are bad moves, unless you take the bigger picture that says we've got to get off of this, this, uh, this hill and get to, the, you know, get to the real goal that we're after. So I think you know, too many people uh, measure progress as distance from the start. Mm. And progress is reducing distance to the goal. Yes. Oh, I like that a lot. That's so, really nice. I also yeah. want to chime in on the on the chat thread um, about you know members on the team often being informal leaders and leading from every chair. And this is one of the reasons why I, I draw that sort of embedded Venn diagram because yes, leaders are are everywhere and 
absolutely bonus points if they then take on uh, responsibility for enabling their colleagues and peers. And it would be great if, if people did. But it is your job when you are a manager to enable them. It is no longer optional. <laughs> and so that's <laughs> part of why I gear this towards man. Anybody can use it. It'd be lovely if they did. But you kind of gotta. People, people actually, the language is the part of the problem, right? The language is part of it. Nobody wants to be managed. I go all over the world. I ask people who likes to be managed. Nobody raises their hand. Manage stuff, manage schedules, manage finances, but lead people. And then the whole organization is designed to fail. I have an exercise that takes 20 minutes. We put four people in three levels of hierarchy and yeah. give the, the, the we, in 10 minutes, everybody's angry. Yeah. And, and it's because it's designed to be dysfunctional because of the hierarchy and poor communication and lack of goal clarity. Now, never mind that MIT, uh, Ellen Grace Henson, the graduate of MIT, MIT Sloan Management published a few years ago that the top four reasons for teams failing all over the world is uh, they don't build trusting relationships, they don't have good communications, problem solving, decision making, goals are not clear, and individual and team priorities are not aligned. But forget about it, all right? Who cares about research and facts? Look at COVID. If we cared about research and facts, we would not be opening up businesses right now to create a second wave that's going to kill even more people. People, they're not important. Thank you for bringing your passion, Kimberly. It's so awesome. That's which data you put. Yeah. <laughs> the, the beautiful thing is an aside that you can count on with Kimberly is her bringing her passion. It, yes, it, it, it is great. a yeah, awesome. in an otherwise I find it very community. inspiring. Do you know where that chicken has been, young lady? <laughs> oh, what the clock! <laughs> don't don't, don't touch your chicken's face either. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that chicken wearing a mask? Oh my! Don't start. Never mind. Okay, here we go. Here we go. I'll be <laughs> be. All right, all right. Yeah, now all I'm going right. to come back. So there was one question that nobody asked me. Okay. And so I'm going to share lead. my screen again. Nobody asked me whether or not our triangle won the contest. <laughs> and so, wait, wait, uh, of wait, course. Wait, wait, Bell, Bell, yeah. can I ask you a question? Yes, please. Did your triangle win the contest? <gasps> Funny you should ask. Uh, <laughs> so when we submitted our designs, uh, our professors actually, they were, it was, uh, this was co-taught, um, they, they showed us all of the different designs. Um, and ours was the only triangle. When we got to the day of the contest, there were two triangles. Oh, this is our lovely little triangle. Uh, and this was the uh, competitive competitors triangle. And so there were two standout structures that held far more force than anything else. It was in fact the two triangles, um, but our uh, slipshod construction strangely did not hold up as well as this much more balanced uh, beauty over here. So yes, our design won the contest, but it's more than just design. You also have to execute it well. Yeah, I was going to say, you could tell, look at the top, how the, no offense, but. Oh, no, it's awful. <laughs> yeah, how, the, how they're joined together. This, yep. this, yeah. This is there. Right. The top is literally slipshod. <laughs> There is a there is a moral to this story. There is a moral to this story. There is a moral to this story, yes. And I, I believe Bell has admitted to all of this. So and I, this preparing for this this evening has also inspired me. I'm going to go email my professors and ask them because I know I have gotten miles out of this contest, but now I'm really curious what exactly they thought I was supposed to get out of it. So. Did they not like the smiley face? I we did not get bonus <laughs> points for the smiley face. Yeah. I did. You know, Bill, you're you took ownership and you're accountable, and right. I I think that's fabulous. Yeah, it definitely did not take me years of maturity to get over being bitter about losing. <laughs> uh, I mean, now that's... everybody wants to give you a hassle about it, so they're no, bringing no, all it... that trauma back. Let it go. Let it go. No, no it, it, in all seriousness, I have come to really appreciate that it was our design that won, and there is a real lesson there. Design is not enough. So. Right, right, right. right. No, it was, never mind. It was, no, just, no. Oh. it was also a good illustration of the one-upmanship in the culture where people had to continue, more than one person had to point out the failure of your construction. That's all. And so the, the question that's relative to the Silicon Valley engineering leadership community is, are you still in relationship with the other people on that team? 
Ooh, so that's a yeah. very interesting word choice because I dated one of them for the next five years. <laughs> um, that is not my husband, so no. <laughs> I wonder who added a hook to it and made it into a clothes hanger. <laughs> <laughs> oh my! For Thank a very big jacket. Thank you for asking <laughs> that question because what do we say about SVELC? Like the relationship lasts longer, longer than, the than the yes, relationships <laughs> last longer than your job. <laughs> relationships last longer than the companies in silicon valley yeah except for timco <laughs> well i'll have to start tight, whoever that was awesome. yeah, that so bell do you have uh you know some final words you want to uh bring to wrap things up i would say my my final words on this one is just to say thank you to everyone for the ideas you brought back from the breakout sessions um i've spent quite a bit of time thinking about this and thinking of different sort of ways to uh, help use this terminology to get people who are maybe not so high on the EQ scale to figure out how to value people anyway. Um, and there were a whole bunch of different ideas that I heard from the breakout rooms and elsewhere that I had not thought of. And so it's, a, it's fabulous when so many minds can uh, instantly prove that it's better to work together. Um, so really appreciate what you all brought to the table and thank you for having me this evening. Thank, Thank you. you. Bell. That, was right. excellent, Bell. that was excellent, Bell. Yeah, Thank great. Uh, many thanks to Bell Walker, um, Bellevue Consulting, uh, uh, and not Bellevue like the hospital in, uh, in, in New York. So that it's B-E-L-L-E view <laughs> to keep that in mind. And we really appreciate the, uh, the, the contribution to uh, the uh, SDLC, the Silicon Valley Yes, thank you. During leadership community, yes, I got my letters transposed there. And, and, and once again, thank you very much.